Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by DraftKings 2021 U.S. Open field research stats and maybe some early picks if you missed the DraftKings picks show that came out on Saturday afternoon with Ben Raza so just rewind yourself on the podcast feed or go to Mayo Media Network and subscribe by the way and just go watch that show up right now we make our picks at each level I'll be back on Monday with bets with Feinberg Rick Gaiman and I will be talking player by player on Tuesday and then Wednesday. It is the final picks, the weather, the card, and a live chat with you, the audience. If you have any of your questions, save them until noon Eastern time on Wednesday on Mayo Media Network. All of the stats in the show are going to be powered by FantasyNational.com. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo gets you 20% off, and this is major season. There are millions of dollars available on DraftKings this week. Uh, shockingly enough, the betting market still exists, so if you want an advantage on both of those, highly recommend FantasyNational.com slash Mayo for that 20% off. Go get it right now. Newsletter link in the description. I'm going to put one out on Monday night and Wednesday evening with a bunch of research tools, some free money giveaways. Like if you want to join new sites, I might be able to get you some bucks on those sites and more than you think, actually. So uh, take me up on that or you can just email free money to the Pat Mayo experience at gmail.com and I can hook you up over there. If you've done it, respond to my emails. Uh, if you've already put one over there because, you know, I still got the free money on the go. And the Listener's League link, 5,000 spots this week. Link is in the description. I got thousands of dollars to give away as well. Well, not thousands. I have $1,000 to give away this week for the U.S. Open. Uh, you'll be wanting to follow me on Twitter at the PME. I got $500 worth of giveaways over there. That should be coming out on Tuesday afternoon. So pay attention to that. Otherwise, there are two ways to get into the draws for $500 one, you can find both in the description, easy to use links, Apple Podcasts only, because that's the only way we can actually track the reviews. So sign up for an Apple account, go leave a five-star review, something you enjoy about the show in your Twitter handle or email address so I can contact you if you are a winner on both the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast, that is very important, and Daily Fantasy Sports Picks and Bets the Mix, where we're also going to be having U.S. Open content, specifically from a European angle, maybe talking about a lot of the guys that you might not know about in this field. Skylar and Tom have the European bet picks and bet show going down really well there. So please go check that out and leave those ratings and reviews. It helps out the show tremendously. And if you do it, you know, you're in a pool to win 500 bucks. And it's not even like a ticket into anything. You just get cash. So why wouldn't you want to do that? Like I mentioned, go check out the DraftKings pitch show with Ben Raza. That's already up on the Mayo Media Network feed and the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast. Let's talk about the field very briefly. It's 156 players. At Torrey Pines this week, you're going to see a lot of just generic qualifiers from the very bottom. You probably don't want to use those guys. Not to say that they're not going to make the cut. I'm sure some are. Which ones? Couldn't tell you. So I'm just going to cross them all off my sheet to limit my player pool somehow. And as Ben and I talked about on the DraftKings pick show, you know, when we get into a circumstance where Rom and DJ are going to be very highly owned, and I don't see much of a differentiation between them and, let's say, Bryson and Brooks, you know, you're going to have, you can't play everyone. So you have to start crossing some names off, some hard decisions. Like I mentioned, put your hard decision from the top of the board in the comments section, because I'm just curious to know. Like, I'm fading DJ and Rom as of right now. I can always change my mind. That's why I do these shows every single day. I gather some more information. I'm going to do some more research when it comes down to it. So on Wednesday, I'll have the final picks. But as of right now, that is my lean. And when we dig into the stats for the course and the field, uh, we're going to have some more of that too. Top 60 and ties at the year's third major championship. So expect a six of six, around like two to three percent, like we see at the U.S. Open almost every single year. This is the hardest of all the majors to sneak all six of your players through. It's the largest of the fields tied for the largest of all the fields, but the fewest amount of people make the cut. It's top 50 in ties at the Masters, but there's only like 90 players in that field. So you have almost double what you see there. Well, not quite almost double. You know what I mean. At the U.S. Open, at a really tricky track where you just know the USGA is going to pump it full of rough and make it as difficult as possible. So you're going to see some big names miss the cut. Hopefully you can avoid those landmines. That's going to be wildly unpredictable, but hopefully we can get a sense of who is going to do well at the field this time around. All the big players you need to know are going to be playing. Tiger Woods is not playing. Doesn't appear like Matthew Wolf will be playing either last year's runner-up at 
the U.S. Open to Bryson DeChambeau. So I always like Matthew Wolf. I even like him on these tracks out on the West Coast. But you know, don't play him this week because who knows where, even if he does end up in the field, who knows where his game is at at the moment. I would not expect him to play. The only other one of concern right now is John Rahm, who is still isolating for testing positive for COVID-19. We saw that at the Memorial, and that's how Patrick Cantlay ended up winning that event. He is expected to be out of quarantine the Tuesday before the U.S. Open, so just keep up to date on that. I would expect there to be no problems with him as long as he's gone through and his test comes back negative. He will be in the field, but there's always an outside chance that this lingers for a little bit more than maybe everyone expected, or maybe he's not feeling well, something like that. I'm not quite sure. I would just say put some alerts on, maybe even Google alerts for John Rahm just to see what is going on with him, just to solidify that by Wednesday that he's actually going to be in the field because if he's not hot tip don't play him actually if you're competing against me maybe in some head-to-heads do play him if he's not playing but only if you're playing me otherwise you probably want to stay away if he has to withdraw for whatever reason i still do not expect that to happen let's jump over to the course tory pine south you are familiar with it i'm sure uh, if you watched the 2008 u.s open where the winning score was let's see here's the here's the winning score minus one Tiger and Rocco went to there. We all know Tiger had the torn ACL, beat Rocco in the 18-hole playoff. The next day, Lee Westwood was even, and then no one at plus one, and a whole bunch of players at plus two, plus three, plus four. They're going to gear this out to be as difficult as possible this time around. Just like you know the USGA is going to do every single year. They don't want anyone to be hanging a minus eight, minus 12 out there. Not to say that that can't happen. The quality of player is so good at this point, but they're going to try to make it as difficult as possible to navigate around so expect this course to play much more difficult than we see it during the farmers insurance open back at the end of january the only real changes uh, there's going to be different lengths on the holes obviously it's longer it's now a par 71 instead of a par 72 they might make one of the holes drivable as a par four sometimes the usga enjoys to do that but every single day you're going to see that the course is shifted around a little bit in terms of length but expect it to play right around 7700 yards the entire time Uh, with the Poa Greens. More Kikuya grass in the rough, that really thick rough that can get your club caught. You see it predominantly on the west coast of the United States. South Africa also has a lot of Kikuya grass. So maybe... There is something to that, even in a Tiger Woods report that I was reading from after 2008, essentially, like, you can get your ball buried in the Kikuya and you have to play it back out to the middle of the fairway with a 50-yard pitch shot just to get yourself out of the hell. Or sometimes you can just end up on a really good lie in the Kikuya grass, too. It's just resting up and everything is fine. You're not going to know until you walk up into the ball. I would say just prepare for the worst, uh, and then you'll be doing a lot better. And when we break down the course, you're basically just going to see the long par fives, the long par threes, and a whole bunch of holes measuring over 450 yards in par fours. So when I did the custom modeling, that's what I put out. You can see on the screen already, I have some of these players starred. Uh, That's what I do with Raza when I do the first run of the show. I put the stars next to all the players that have made the short list already. Guys get added, guys get taken away throughout the course of the week. And we can even see some of the ownership projections very early on from fantasynational.com. These are not going to be hyper accurate being that I'm recording this on a Saturday evening. Uh, you'll want to check in with these on Wednesday evening when you can see only 1,400 lineups have been generated so far. Shout out to everyone getting out there early, generating lineups as early as possible. Maybe some people just like to tinker around with that, but you can just see in the actual lineup percentage here on the right-hand side of the screen where those players are actually coming out. So like Bryson's a bit lower, Brooks is a bit lower, very few people using Justin Thomas so far. I would say that the calculated ownership this early on in the week is probably a more it's a better guide to what is going on and as ben and i talked about you're probably going to see a lot of ownership congregating in this area with xander hovlin Cantley, and even Fino, and that is somewhat reflective so far i think that more people will be on morikawa who use the site than the general public just like i think that fewer people are going to be on jordan spieth who use fantasy national than the public because he's just as 
such a big public name uh, that that's the lean that I would have this early in the week. Like I said, it doesn't really mean that much at this point, but it does give you a sense of where people's first looks are. And sometimes the first look is a great way to judge how the public is going to react. Like, oh, that name is this price. I'm going to click on them. That name is that price. Well, that seems too expensive. I'm not going to go go on to that. We'll see some of these flatten out. We'll get a better sense of who's going to be over 20% owned in the DraftKings Millionaire Maker going forward. However, like you see Tyrrell Hatton. Like, if Hatton comes back and wins at Palmetto, he's going to be much higher than that. But right now, Hatton and Cam Smith and Matthew Fitzpatrick, you know, three European players that are pretty down on the list right now. I guess Cam Smith isn't a European player. He's an Australian player. So international players, mind you, are down on this list. And you can see where people are congregating towards. Zalatoris and Finau in that $8,000 area. That range in the nines that I talked about. It's just going to leave a lot of opportunities. Like, I would expect more people to use Justin Thomas than Rory McIlroy. That's just the sense that I get coming into the week. And I really like Rory. Now, if, it, if this holds true and Rory is 16% owned and Justin Thomas is 5% owned, I'm going to use Justin Thomas because there's not that much that separates them. Although I do prefer the skill set that Rory brings to the table this week in terms of what his major strengths are as a player versus someone like Justin Thomas. But at the same time, like there's not that much separating them. It's basically just driving distance uh, and putting from time to time because Rory doesn't generally get as cold with the putter as Justin Thomas does. He also rarely gets as electric with his irons as Justin Thomas does. So there's some give and take with it, but I would probably take the distance over anything else going forward. I do want to check back in on that leaderboard from 2008 because it's not really instructive to look at Tiger Woods. Tiger is awesome. Tiger has won 16 majors. So no one is Tiger Woods in this field. So that he's, it's not really helpful to look at Tiger Woods and what he does. Well, he did everything well at this point. And there's no player today who kind of mimics that. But looking at the rest of the leaderboard, you got Mediate, Westwood, good tee to green players. Not always the best putters either, by the way. Robert Carlson as an amateur, DJ Trahan, Miguel Angel Jimenez, John Merrick, who had won at Genesis in Los Angeles about two hours north of this course. So maybe that there is something to look at Genesis. I don't want to put too much emphasis on it. It's like I said, the course history from farmers, so much has changed that I don't know how predictive that's going to be. I think that looking at it causes you no harm, but I wouldn't say that like, oh, this guy always plays well at farmers. He's going to play well at the U.S. Open or vice versa. I don't know if that's necessarily going to apply, just especially with the rough length. Like when you see someone like Mark Leishman, the year that he won at the Farmers, especially in the final round, the fact that he was still able to hit so many greens from where he was off the tee, I just don't think that's going to be possible with a USGA setup. So it's not going to come down to him having to make 10-foot par putts. He's going to be making 10-foot bogey putts. Thus, he is not going to win. Eric Axley, Jeff Ogilvie, who was a big hitter at the time in 2008. You have to remember that going through it. Uh, same as L, same as Goose, same as Sink. So just a lot of big hitters. I think that's the lean that you want to take. Like you want overall players that can do well across the board, but my lean would be to driving distance. That's why it is so hard to knock off Rom and Dustin Johnson right away, but that's in favor of Bryson Brooks and Rory for me. I mean, the, all those guys are big hitters. That's why they're up there in the world rankings by how good they are off the tee. Spieth is the outlier of this whole bunch, and I do have him highlighted right now because I want to do some more digging on Spieth. His approach game has been immaculate. We've seen him win a U.S. Open, so I don't... I think that you're going to have outliers at the top of the leaderboard that aren't just bombers off the tee. And Smith is most definitely one of those guys. Patrick Reed is another one of those guys as well, where obviously they don't have the same distance, but their scrambling ability in tough conditions is just so valuable that it's really hard to overlook them. And I just want to see how the public feels about them and where they come in in tournaments, because I can get behind that. Like someone like Webb Simpson has three straight top 20s at U.S. Opens, and he's not a bomber by any means. I do have him start on my list, because I always always love me some Webb Simpson. He's also won a U.S. Open. He won it in California, putts really well on Poa Greens, and his long approach has been off recently, but that really was his bread and butter over the past two years when he became an elite player in the world. So let's dig into the custom modeling and see how we're doing with this. I've already set one up. Uh, and there's different ways you want to do it. I have U.S. Open driving distance over fairways is the note I made for myself, as you can see, off the tee, weighted 15%, driving distance 10%, fairways gained at 5%. I think you're smart enough to be able to parse that out, that 
I, I just want it more for a comparison tool. Like this is going to be very unfavorable to maybe some of the bombers who aren't the most accurate, but it will still give them a bit more of a boost than someone like Brennan Todd, for example. It'll, although Brennan Todd will be first in fairways gain, he will be close to last in driving distance. So where I have dro- driving distance weighted as double between those two, that should even it out and give more of a lean towards the bombers. At least that's what I'm telling myself as I run through the custom modeling. Strokes gained approach, 20%, could be higher, but I have other approach categories in here, so I wanted to cap it out right there. Proximity, 175 to 200. Proximity, 200 plus, both at 10%. Around the green, 10%. Par 4s, 450 to 500 yards at 15%. And yes, that number does include putting. That's why I did not include putting into this model. You can put it in if you want. You can take it out if you want. These are POA greens. They're U.S. Open firm greens. They're going to run incredibly fast. So I don't know how much this general strokes game putting is going to tell you. Maybe if you make a mixed condition, model you can wait like 15 percent players that play really well on both firm greens and lightning fast to fast greens we can even look that up as we go through this but that's how i wanted to put my putting into it was on holes from that length and i also put in proximity from 100 to 125 yards i spoke about how the rough is going to be so thick that if we have situations where players need to play it out sideways or just advance it a little bit out of the rough then you're going to see a situation where players are going to be forced to get it up and down from 100 to 125 yards. Uh, And the players that can do that well are going to survive. That's Zach Johnson special at the U.S. Open, being able to make par from that distance. I think that that's essentially me putting scrambling, especially deep scrambling, into my model. And I think this is just more predictive than looking at scrambling percentage. Because it does take putting out of it, too, where... I want the guys that are sticking it to seven feet, eight feet and making those putts from this range. Not the guys that put it to 35 feet and get a lucky putt and put it in the hole. I want that stuff wiped out of the model. So that's why I have 100 to 125 yards in terms of proximity range in there. So that's the logic that I'm using. I might even change this up as the week goes along. I will throw in putting or I'll make that mixed condition model and everything will be fine from that regard. So I have it set to the past 36 rounds. Once again, fantasynational.com slash mayo gets you all full access to this. You can customize it any way you want. I spoke about the mixed condition model. You can, I don't even know what I have in there right now. There's a video up there about how to use it uh, done by me. So you can go check that out if you want. Essentially, you can put in different round time, different lengths of time. You can switch everything to POA if you wanted to and just look at putting stats from there and just put that specific stat into your model. Putting on POA last 24 rounds. And then you can be like, oh, I actually want to see driving distance over the past 100 rounds on courses that measure over 7,400 yards because that gives you a better barometer of driving distance than players that might just take less than driver off the tee if it's something like under 7,200 yards. And you can piece together the actual stats that you want to, then run the mixed condition model. It's been very successful for a lot of members over the years who have done that. I should do it more, to tell you the truth, but, you know, I run out of time during the week, and that just happens. Uh, I'm... I like to build them sometimes by myself, see how they go, and then I try to te- back test the results after the fact. I like sticking to the custom model for the purposes of this show, though. So over the past 36 rounds, what we're looking at, Hovland, Rom, JT, three guys I don't have stars next to. Excellent news for me. Good start. Brooks Kepka, Patrick Cantlay, Bryson DeChambeau, Morikawa, Big Will Z, Corey Connors, Jason Kokrak, then Xander Rory Homa. Paul Casey and Scotty Scheffler will be your top 15. The best of the low-end players, Streelman and Matt Wallace, both pop up on that list. My guy, Shane Lowry, who I do have a bet in on, is also number 20 on that list. And if we parse through uh, each of the different ones, and you can sort by any round you really want to, the farther you go back, the more baseline you're going to get for these skills. But even if you want to shrink it to the past 12 rounds, just to see who is coming in in the form that you want to see, And that can be very instructive, too, to see who is firing up at absolutely the right time. And if you go to sample size and go to rolling report, you can just see you won't see each individual stats for the custom model, but it'll give you the custom model ranking over each period of time displayed in a grid all on your screen. So you might even want to check that out. Maybe I'll even pull that up here in a second. So. If we look at fairways gained, I think this can be instructive of the top guys. We'll just set by salary. Who is the most accurate of the players at the top? Well, it's Morikawa, and it's not even close. Actually, Hovland is a bit behind him. Patrick Reed, a bit more accurate off the tee than you would actually think of as well. 
But with Reed and Morikawa, they're both in the bottom half of this field in terms of driving distance. So they'll have to do more with both their long irons and around the green game and hopefully have to make some putts. The reason behind the driving distance and what we've seen at the U.S. Open essentially each of the past five years and even dating back is they put the rough up so much that Bryson found the hack last year. And it happened with DJ and Brooks and even Tommy Fleetwood to an extent. Then you had who else was up there? Xander and Finau and Burger that you're at Shinnecock where if you just blast it out there and you only have 120 yards to the hole no matter how thick the rough is you can still elevate the ball into the air and get them to land on these greens that's just so hard to do for especially shorter power players and they're 173 in the rough they're gonna have to roll the ball up they're gonna have to rely on getting the ball up and down on these fast greens and that's just a tougher path to go with and that isn't to say take guys like let's sort by driving distance here so bryson is that to say you should play champ maybe i'm not gonna be playing champ i think you could make the case because he is a bomber but you see the rest of his numbers he's fucking pathetic so that's not very good either Wyndham clark i think is a very interesting one you can see i have him start ben and i spoke about him on the DraftKings pick show where he is someone with a ton of driving distance not very accurate but you know that he has the power but he's really good around the greens too uh, and it's like long proximity isn't great, but that's where he can kind of make up for it. He's not a complete disaster. He's about field average on the par fours from 400 to 450 for, to 500. I would actually call 79th well below because you're dealing with a lot of players in the field who just don't have enough stats to qualify, like inventor of Pog, Steve Allen. Um, I don't know much about Steve Allen. Apparently he has 36 rounds to go from. Who the fuck is Steve Allen? The Greenbrier in 2019 is the last time that we got anything weighted for from him so hasn't been a good go for Steve Allen probably don't want to play Steve Allen but you have some of these guys in the mix is the point that I'm trying to make is they're kind of clogging up some of the stats so you really want to minus like 20 to 30 players in this field and some of the european players don't have accurate stats because this only takes pga tour data some of the majors don't have data some of the wgc's that these guys play in also do not have data so their european tour numbers are not mixed into this so they just have such a small sample size that maybe you're not getting the right view on them there's more research to always be done and more digging to do but in terms of driving distance bryson you can kind of get behind neiman Almost has to play perfectly flawless golf this week. And here's the issue with Neiman. It seemed like he was getting a lot better around the greens. And then the last few months happened. And it's just been a fucking train wreck. Minus two, minus three, minus three and a half, minus three. Not bad at Velspar. Minus five and a half. He's still making cuts. He finally missed one at Memorial, thus ending the longest cut made streak. I can see him making the cut, no problem. It's just when the scoring gets ratcheted up so much that do these bogeys become double bogeys because he's leaving the ball by his feet when he's trying to get it up and down. Like, that's the part that worries me with Neiman. The ball striking is immaculate. The putting has been really good. You can still make viable cases for Neiman, especially at his price point at $7,500 and the betting odds that he comes in with. But if we're talking about projecting out to win, do you want to go overweight so much on a player that there is a path for him just being a disaster? I haven't made a decision on him yet. I can see myself going to him. However, with Neiman, it is that one glaring thing about the around the green game where it's just been so bad. He's also not great uh, obviously from 100 to 125 yards either. Now, with his driving distance, hopefully that's not too big of a concern, although a lot of his approach shots might be coming from that range. Or if he has to advance the ball up and he has to scramble from that range around the green, we already know that he's not good from that range. He's also horrible. So that is something to look for. But the long irons haven't really been there recently either. It's more of the 200 and in, for like the 125 to 200 and the driving distance are really carrying him at the moment. So maybe that's not the greatest thing to go with. Someone like Fratelli, you just wish the irons were a lot better because he's top 10 in driving distance and he's top 10 around the greens and he's good with his, so he can scramble no problem, but it's just he gets himself into so much trouble because his irons are so bad. And when you go down the list, you're going to have to really commit to what you think is acceptable and how bad someone can be because there's no one in the $6,800 range or the $7,500 range that you look at and be like, well, they're just awesome players. They're probably going to win. There's a reason that they're $7,300 this week in a major championship. Once you get outside the first top 15 players, you're going to have to make some hard choices with the type of player that you really want to go with. Woodland is trending back up there. We've seen him play well at US Open's past. Um, obviously, his game isn't completely right at the moment, 
But I, I wouldn't name He's someone who's played Torrey Pines well over the years. He's won a U.S. Open in California. But it's nice to see that the putting hasn't been an abject failure. The approaches have been really good. The driving has been hit and miss. But... The driving distance has been really good. So we can even go a bit more in-depth into someone on Gary Woodland and look at his driving and accuracy and see what pops up there. Driving distance gain has not been a problem at any course except for concession, probably because he kept going in the fucking water. Uh, You don't get a whole lot of credit on distance when you're plopping into the middle of the lake. Everywhere else, though, he is still gaining against each of these fields. The fairways were good. Then they were bad, or they are bad at the moment, but we've just seen him play really well at U.S. Opens uh, in the past few years. So I wouldn't really too worry too much about him. I think he is going to be fine. You see Sergio is also up there. If we're trying to find the best distance players with accuracy, at least very strong distance, mid-level to above-average accuracy. You have Xander and Kokrak. Rom is probably the very best of the top end players, but Scheffler is better. And then you have this little range with Casey and Schwartzel, both a ton of distance, very decent accuracy. Uh, someone like Victor Hovland is probably the best of both if you were to weight those. Matt Wallace is also up there too. 40th in driving distance, 44th in fairways gain. You know I like me some Matt Wallace. Very good around the greens as well. Not the best with the long irons, but if he can save himself around the greens, then it might not be that big of a deal. We saw him at the PGA Championship, that long and tough one at Beth Page that Brooks won. Matt Wallace finished inside the top five that year. Even someone like Spieth. Like, it's funny that even I fall under the trap, too, because he's not top 10 in driving distance. So he is 42nd in driving distance in this field over the past 24 rounds. And the accuracy isn't horrible. Sam Ryder checks really well out in both. That's about all he does well. Michael Johnson, the 200-meter sprinter that Donovan Bailey called a chicken because he wouldn't race with him. After pulling out, he pulled up lame in that, that one-off 150-meter event at Skydome back in, like, 1993. He's a chicken. That's what Donovan Bailey said. His words, not mine. Although I believe them. Probably don't want to use Michael Johnson. Justin Su, oh my guy, he's up there. You have Lowry. Kyle Westmoreland, that's a name. Uh, Rikua Hoshino. He rates out pretty well on both. Higo's up there, too, although the fairways gain isn't so great. Victor Perez, better accuracy. Jordan L. Smith, another guy coming over. Two guys that Sky and Tom will talk about a lot on the European Tour Picks and Bet show. Same as Matthias Schmidt, who was an amateur. You've seen him play at API in the past. Hasn't really been all that good, to tell you the truth. Tyrrell Hatton, average distance above average accuracy. Same as Hideki. Same as Steele. Same as Harris English. Then you have someone like Thomas Aiken, who Ben and I didn't realize was still alive. He He's going to be playing in this tournament. Streelman is a very accurate player. Miko uh, Koronen, he's going to be wearing that stupid... I think he's the one who wears the stupid fedora. I can never remember with him. Uh, now we're down to like the back end of the field. If we just take a look at fairways gain, you can see that Aiken, Streelman, still below. Billy Horschel's another below average, but good accuracy player. Jordan Smith, that's only 12 rounds of data, and I'd even be curious to see where that's coming from. I want to see Hashino first. Let's see. Missed the cut at the PGA. Played the Sony, made the cut. We can look him up, though. On the official World Golf Rankings, just just see how he's doing at the moment Uh, in some of the other tours. The last time he played was the PGA Championship, missed the cut, won T15, T23, won over on the Japanese Tour. I don't really know how much that's telling us, but it's nice to see that the distance is up there for him uh, and the accuracy isn't all that bad either. Someone like Tom Hoagie actually has really good strokes gained at Torrey Pines South over the years. I thought that was kind of interesting because he is not someone that I ever really remember playing well at the Farmers Insurance Open, but we can just see by his stats. Farmers, miscut fifth, miscut 12th, miscut, miscut. So he has pop performances or or he's god awful. That's not absolutely the worst thing to see. You can see that the approach play there is always pretty good. And if we see him in accuracy, he's not going to put himself into too many problems. Don't hate that. Maybe Hoagie is someone you can look at. 6,700 seems like a lot, though, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. For someone, uh, there are just better players that are potentially cheaper prices. Where's my guy Taylor Pendrith? I'm playing him. Pendrith off the Corn Ferry Tour, 21st in driving distance. Uh, Pretty decent around the greens in the times that we've seen him. He made the cut at the U.S. Open the last time around. No great finishes on the PGA Tour 53rd at the Puerto Rico Open, 23rd at the U.S. Open. He's going to bomb it. He's going to chip. He's going to putt a lot of the time. Uh, You can even see that here uh, back at the Canadian Open that he played when he was an amateur. Very good off the tee, very good around the greens, can make some putts. We've seen him pop at some more of the difficult courses on the Corn Ferry Tour last year. He had a run of third, second, second, second 
uh, not necessarily in, yeah, all in consecutive weeks as well, almost at least. That was coming off the U.S. Open last year, the U.S. Open in 2020 when he tied for 44th. So uh, he has two starts at the U.S. Open. He's made it both times. I, I think that's pretty interesting to go through. Oh, hi, everyone. It's Pat Mayo here, once again, telling you about Manscaped.com. You'll get 20% off plus free shipping with the code Mayo20. So I just want to start out with that. Part number two, your dad. He sucks at buying gifts for himself, and you suck at buying gifts for Father's Day for your dad. Think about the same thing that you've bought him for the past 10 years. I think every guy is exactly the same. Mother's Day, you might put some thought into that. You might pick a different color rose every single year or a different kind of flower. For Father's Day, here's a sweatshirt. Here's a golf club. Here's a hat. Now, you tell him he needs to shave his nuts with a weed whacker from Manscaped.com. Probably don't put that in the card, but you just get it for him and he can figure out the rest, okay? So what we're going to be doing here is getting 20% off with free shipping from Manscaped.com with code MAYO20. And there's just a bunch of stuff that, you know, his balls are going to thank you. His balls produced you. So the least you can do is give him something in return to show your appreciation for it on Father's Day. And you might ask, how is the Lawn Mower 4.0 different than any other of the ball trimmers? Well, this upgraded trimmer includes multifunction on and off and can engage a travel lock, which is a great feature if your dad does a lot of traveling. I've heard this around the world, traveling starting to happen again. So why not get him the best trimmer with the travel lock on it? There's a new wireless charging station that uses electromagnetic electromagnetic induction, which can help battery length last longer. And you heard that right, wireless charging ball trimmers are now a real thing. The Weed Whacker and Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer is the best nose hair trimmer on the market, and it really is the perfect gift for your pops. But don't worry about all the ball stuff. Your dad's probably not going to shave his balls. Maybe he does. Maybe he's a very well-groomed, manscaped man. I appreciate that. I am a ball shaver myself. I mean, you probably don't need to know that. I mean, you can probably tell that by looking at me. I shave my chest, too, so you know the balls are coming along for the ride. But, you know, if your dad has, like, gross nose hair and gross ear hair, uh, yeah, the Weed Whacker from Manscaped is where you want to be going. Just get it for him. Like I said, he will use it. Dads hate leaving stuff going to waste. So they'll use it at least once. They'll be like, oh, I can breathe better out of my nose. Oh, I can hear out of my ear because it's not full of fucking cotton, a.k.a. hair. I mean, it's not AKA hair, but just there's so much. My grandpa's, I'm going to get this for my grandpa for Father's Day. Because I think that he, he either pretends not to hear me. He doesn't have hearing problems. He either pretends not to hear me or he has so much goddamn hair in his ear that it's just become a problem for him to have any of the audio coming in at this point. I'm loud. So either he's faking it or he just legit can't hear me. We sent him to an ear hearing test. He was fine. So I don't know what his deal is. So once again, for your dad, get the weed whacker uh, and you can get the nose hair trimmer and the ear hair trimmer, all a part of that because you can get 20% off plus free shipping with code MAYO20 at checkout at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code MAYO20. And don't forget that you came from your dad's balls. So this year, show your original home some love with Manscaped. I want to take a look back at some of the strokes gain numbers to see if we can really kind of point to what we can glean from the U.S. Open and the type of players that we want to see. So you can always select the year over on the right-hand side on Fantasy National under the drop-down bar into select view. We can go to strokes gained. And the only reason I don't mind comparing courses like this, just because it's the USGA setup and I think that USGA setups have more in common with each other each and every year, despite what the course may be, rather than looking at a weaker setup at the same course like we would see with the Farmers Insurance Open. I could be wrong on that. I'm not admitting that I know or don't know either way, but that's the lane that I'm going to pick when I'm doing my research. And you can see the only player to lose strokes off the tee was Thomas inside the top 10 and Zach Johnson, I suppose. And they both chipped and putted the lights out. Zach Johnson especially putted the lights out. So that was interesting to see. But if we want to quite quantify bombers, Bryson, bomber, Wolf, bomber, Louie, good average, above average accuracy, same as English, bomber for Xander, bomber for Zalatoris, DJ, obviously, better accuracy player with Webb Simpson. And we can even kind of look at that to see driving and fairways gained, greens and regulation gained. So the only players inside the top 10, and that was 12 players, to lose distance off the tee were Louis and Zach Johnson, and they both made it up with fairways gained. You can see, it's, it's funny, as the bomb and gouge effect that we talked about with Bryson, he still gained on the field. <laughs> for the week, and he was able to hit all those greens in regulation. Very Patrick Reed-type week. Didn't drive it all that far. 
didn't hit many fairways, didn't hit many greens in regulation, and still came in 13th. It's a very classic Patrick Reed type. That's almost how he did it at Farmers earlier this year. So that's why you can never really count him out. So you see, like, Rory, a bunch on the field. Dustin, a bunch. Zalatoris gained minimally, but he still gained. Then you have even English gained a bunch. Wolf and Bryson obviously way up there as well. If we just sorted by driving distance gained for the week, you, know, you see the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the top guys all finished inside the top 23 for the week. Ryan Fox missed the cut. And then the next two, 17th and 8th, a missed cut. Kokrak, 17th. Like, I, you got to think that's really telling in terms of driving distance. Ryan Fox, not a great player. Probably why he missed the cut. But everyone else, you know, a pretty balanced type player. They do more than just one thing well when it comes to driving distance. They can either chip or they're good putters or they're good approach players, whatever it may be. And you can see how much that distance carried them a year ago. Will that translate? I mean, that's really hard to say. Let's take a look at 2000. 19 and see if it tells us anything similar that was the year at pebble beach it was a shorter obviously u.s open so maybe the stats will be juked a little bit on that one but if we go to fairways gained and see what happened sort by driving distance all right it's a little bit different so of the one two three four five six seven eight nine ten top players sorry ten top players in the field we'll throw matt wall say top 11 because he came in 12th uh, you have the winner, the second place finisher, the third place finisher, the ninth place finisher, and the twelfth place finisher. You have one missed cut, and it was Bubba Watson. Should be no surprise that he missed the cut at Pebble Beach. Other than that, of the top players in the field in terms of driving distance gained, of the top 15, 14 of them made the cut. I, again, that is very telling to me that that's why I'm putting an overemphasis on driving distance. I don't want to keep hammering this home because I know that people can come to this conclusion on their own. But for you have to think that this research show is for people who may be just digging in for the first time to get into golf. Uh, that That's something that I really want to look at. Driving distance at the 2008 U.S. Open of the top 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 players uh, in terms of driving distance gained. 1, 2, 3 missed cuts. You also have the winner, the third place finisher, the fifth place finisher, and the sixth place finisher, Tommy Fleetwood, who came in second place, was actually 17th on that list after Matt Jones ended up missing the cut. I don't know who David Gazalo is, but it was interesting to see him up there. So, and you can see in fairways gain, didn't make a difference that year. Uh, so some years you just have to go with the driving distance. And that's why I'm severely overweighting that. I could even go higher than that and drop down off the tee to 10% and crank up driving distance to 15% to see what that is going to give me out. So maybe I do put Neiman back on the list. Maybe someone like Fertelli is viable at a U.S. Open. Who else would be up there? And maybe it's better to look at, like I said earlier, I'll just open up a new tab and just sort by driving distance and go to those numbers. So refresh our feeds. We'll go past 50 rounds. And we're going to throw on the over 7,400-yard courses just so we know that guys are taking driver off the tee and not having to club down. So hopefully that's not skewing the stats. Then we go to fairways and greens and sort by driving distance gained and just see who kind of pops up. Your top players are champ. Wake up, champ. Wake up, rest of your game, champ. Get it together, pal. Rory, Dustin, Bryson, Woodland, Vegas, Bubba. Finau, Burns, and you can almost write off Bubba Watson, although he has won at this course in his career and did make the U.S. Open cut last year. Just check this out. 31st, miscut, miscut, miscut. 51st, miscut, miscut. 32nd, miscut, miscut. Not great, Bubba. Uh, with no finish better than 31st, you probably don't want to put Bubba Watson onto the list. But you have Sam Burns, who's way out there. I'm adding Sam Burns to the list. He played well at Riviera earlier this year. He played well at Farmers. He's putted well on Poa Greens. He has the distance. I like to see it. You know, Xander's never finished, what, worse than sixth in a U.S. Open? Uh, and he is one of those players with these solid around the green games as well. And just overall good. Yeah, fifth, third, sixth, fifth for Xander in four U.S. Open appearances. He's good. You might want to uh, figure that out. Lonto, surprisingly, up there. I'm going to throw Lonto back on my short list. I wasn't even really considering him. Someone like Patrick Rogers played his hard course as well, has a ton of driving distance from California. I think we all know that. So he's on the short list of potential scrubs that I want to go with. 
Uh, I'll throw Neiman onto the list after kind of talking through with him. Rose, someone who shows up in major championships. I don't love his game, but at $8,000, maybe he can find the list. You know, I'm already in on Palmer and Max Homa. So you can just kind of see Brennan Grace, you know, he's playing really well. 40th in driving distance over that time. That's a really good number. So I'm not saying you can't take the guys from down on the list. You can see I have Morikawa, who's 88th of qualified people. You have this whole range of players who just don't qualify, like someone like Higo, who does drive the ball a ton. So maybe he is someone to put on, just like Wilco, although he might end up being incredibly popular if he continues to play well at Palmetto. Uh, you can go over to europeantour.com and find out you know, more about which guys do really well with driving distance from the European tour. But remember, that's weighted against those guys as well if you're looking at strokes gained. So maybe I need to get rid of some of these people. I don't have no idea why I have Rafa Cabrera Bayo listed. I'm going to take him off the list, although he has made five consecutive cuts at U.S. Opens. Eddie Molinari, he's a shortish hitter. He's gained some distance off the tee, and he's playing really well right now. So He's someone that I might want to include. I don't think these guys are absolute cross-offs. Like, I'm probably going to take off Dylon Meyer, although he hits a lot of fairways. If they hit a lot of fairways, they have good long irons and good scrambling around the green. I think you can start making a case back towards some of these players. But I think just the lift is so much more difficult, and as you saw by the results, like, bombers just get it done at the U.S. Open, and that's where you want to go to. Let's click off this for a second and click off and go to past... 24 rounds and check out uh let's say long rough who are the best players in long rough and we can even go see what courses qualify for that over time you can see aronimic baltistral bay hill beth page beth page congressional uh, conway farm so either fedex cup events essentially and detroit golf club uh where bryson actually has won uh, so, you know, this always tends to favor Bryson when we look at it. We'll go from fairways to greens to strokes gained and check that out. So, T to green, who are your best players? Finau, Rom, Cantlay, Casey, Morikawa, Scheffler, and Bryson. Bryson, because of the putting, is actually third in strokes gained total. Uh, Zala, Torres, Dustin, Hideki, and Wolf are up there, too. Of the bottom end of players with just long rough, you don't see a lot of them. Sergio at 75, Streelman at 71 party marty laird at 66 interesting test case for him because he's someone who's played farmers i believe pretty well throughout the course of his career has made a lot of cuts has some top tens so let's get rid of sanderson farms it's been a while since he's generated a top 10 and the approach hasn't been good but if you look at him lately and not a great memorial led the pga championship in strokes gained approach with 11.7 uh couldn't really chip all that weekend uh, but he's someone who's down in the pricing list that he's someone you can make the decision on like okay why is he so good here and at the these types of courses, is this going to translate over? I mean, who's to say, really? But uh, long grass and over 7,500 yards or 7,400 yards, maybe that can narrow the list a little bit for us. Now let's sort by T to green again over the past 24. You know, very similar type names, Finau, Rory Scott, Thomas, Fleetwood, Hideki, Rom, Woodland, Paul Casey, and Rose. When I spoke earlier about the mixed condition model, this is a column I can add. So if I wanted to put in, even let's just say, yeah, T to green is what we want to look for. Past 24 rounds, we can see the filters we have put on right now in terms of long grass and over 7,400 yards. So we'll just make that note. We'll say add it. We have strokes gain T to green. That's the column that I want to use. We'll go last 24 Oh, I spelled over wrong because I'm an absolute jabroni. Over 7,400 yards. Long. Rough. And then you just add that to your mixed condition model. And we can try to add another one in here too. Uh, I'll take off long grass. I'll take off 7,400 yards. And I'll look at past 24 rounds only on POA putting surfaces and see who rises to the top there. So you have Louis, Kucher, Rom, Bryson, Patrick Rogers, Patrick Reed, Webb Simpson, Stumanji, but not the good Stumanji, bad Stumanji, that would be Brian Stewart, Stenson, Hadwin, JT Poston, Wyndham Clark, another boost for Wyndham Clark, man, by a top 20, Wyndham Clark, get him in there, Jimmy Waka, who's playing a little bit better right now. Obviously, he's won at Torrey Pines in the past. Kevin Na, Ian Poulter, Max Homa, Mac Hughes, Sam Burns, Matt Wallace, and Zach Johnson are your top 20. Batia is up there too, but that's only in five rounds. If you click on the rounds, you can see where these stats and round by round are coming from. So that's from the Safeway, and that is from uh, the AT&T Pro-Am at Pebble Beach, where he played really well for a little bit. So what you can do now is add your mixed condition into it as well. So we have past 24 rounds, and we want putting. So putting last 24 
putting, POA. And that's just to use as the identifier when you go back to it. So we're going to click off POA now, and we're going to go back and sort by over 7,400 yards. And we're going to look at past 75 rounds just to mix it up a little bit because this is something I want more of a baseline over time for. As you can see, with someone like Colin Morikawa doesn't even have 25, more than 25 rounds uh, at courses that are over 7,400 yards, at least in terms of weighted numbers. You can just see, you know, the Masters Tournament of Champions, there just aren't that many uh, that actually measure this distance. I want to make sure I have no other filters turned on, thus capping what I'm trying to be looking at here. I don't, so that's good news. Uh, and what we're going to go to is fairways and greens and driving distance gained against the field. So we're going to take past 75 rounds, add that to a mixed condition model, driving distance gained, and last 75, DD gained over 7,400 yards. And we're going to add that, and then we're going to take off the $7,400 or 7,400 hundred yard filter and we're going to re-put in that same stat just to see if there's any discrepancies that might come through sometimes you know the over 74 yard crowd is just a lot of majors so maybe it's not accounting for some of the players that we should be looking at because they're not involved in some of these tournaments and you can see how they gain against other players as well so we're going to add this uh, and just go driving distance gain last 75 last 74 last 75 DD gained overall, and we're going to add that. So all you do now, and you can add any of these columns that you want to, maybe we'll check in uh, around the green as well. Uh, we'll just go to strokes gained, and we'll sort by last 36, give ourselves a smaller sample for around the green play, and just add this filter into it too. So last 36, you can click on around the green, last 36 around the green, and that's all it is. We'll add that column in too. Then we click on our mixed condition model. And now you can see, uh, you can either lock your values or we want to put driving distance. We have two driving distance metrics in here. So that's going to account for 40% of the mix. We'll put in putting at 20%. T to green, I probably want to jack up to 30%. And we'll put in 10% around here. So we have 30, 20, 20, 20. You can, you can factor these any way you want, but they just create a new set of custom rankings for you just based on these specific stats over time. So who does that favor? John Rahm, Bryson, Finau, Fleetwood, Still, Rory, Scott, Xander, Woodland, Dustin, Will Zalatoris, Max Homa, Wyndham Clark, once again, number 12 on that list. Matt Jones, also very good on that list. Number 14, Lonto still, despite the poor play recently. He is 16th on that list. Carlos Ortiz, number 17. So now this is a way that I like to use to identify some sleepers in the field of guys that maybe I just wasn't thinking about. Uh, and when you mix all of their stats together uh, and these specific things that you're looking for from a course, obviously this is getting a huge weighting to guys in terms of driving distance. So maybe you just want to knock that down a little bit and see what happens. We're going to drop both of the driving distances down to 10%. We're going to up around the green to 25%. We're going to take down POA putting. We're going to keep that at, let's say, 15%. And we're going to rake up T to green to 45%. So that gives us T to green 35% around the green. That's probably too much of a weight on around the green. Let's move the let's move T to green to 50 and see what that does for us. And that gives you 15, 15 on putting and around the green, 10 and 10 on the different driving distances. And we'll just see if the how that affects everything to see if some of the same people end up popping up. And they do. Rom, Finau, Fleetwood, Bryson, Adam Scott. Do we have any different sleepers on this list? What I'll do is sort from the bottom up and just see who kind of rates out pretty positively. You'll see some people just don't have enough stats to figure in and the ones that we were looking for. So who does pretty well? Uh, Matthew Southgate is the name I have stuff next to. So no stats here. Rio Ishikawa is 55th. Pop, my guy from France, Paul Baljean. He ended up winning on the Corn Ferry Tour not too long ago. Batia, 48th. So now we get some real guys. At $6,500, Brennan Steele, 29th. Pendrith, even with only two things to actually draw from, is still 32nd when you weight all these things together. Stenson is still 16th. EVR and Wyndham Clark, 40th and 41st. So when you take out driving distance as a huge identifier, Wyndham Clark no longer is good, but it does boost up Lonto and Johnny Vegas and Cameron Young, who just won on the Corn Ferry Tour. You also are going to have, who's shockingly high? Matt Jones, still number 13 on this list. Matt Wallace, number 15. So... 
you can really customize all of these stats, whether it's a mixed condition model, whether it's your own custom model, to really what you want to focus on going forward. So that's why I highly recommend, as always, fantasynational.com slash mayo to get your 20%. There is no place where you can customize exactly what you want to look for. That's been always the key. There's no content on Fantasy National. There are no picks on Fantasy National. It allows you to tell a computer what you want to see, uh, and it makes it easy for you just by walking through. So I hope I've been able to identify the course that we're looking at, the sleepers that we want to use, the skill sets that at least I am targeting this week, and I've shown you how to use the tools just a little bit that you can make your own informed decisions about the players that you want to take this week. But Pendrith, Matt Wallace, Patrick Rogers, good God. Who was the other one that I really liked? Now I completely forget. Uh, uh, Wyndham Clark at $6,700. Like, those could be four sleepers. Maybe I'll build around those four sleepers. Since I lose all my money at the U.S. Open anyway, maybe I'll try to make the core as tight as possible, play 20 lineups. Those are the only players that I'm using from down there and mix and match at the top because you know you have to think, if you can get your sleepers right, they don't need to win. They just really need to make the cut. And it's not like a bunch of scoring is going to happen at the U.S. Open if the winning score is going to be like minus two to plus two. And then you give yourself as many outs as possible at the top of the board with those bombers with the balanced games that we've just seen win the U.S. Open each of the past like 10 years. So that might be the best way to construct lineups. But you can go back and check out the full DraftKings pick show with Ben Raza from Saturday. That's up up on all feeds right now. I did mention the giveaways at the beginning. You can find those links in the description. Rate and review both podcasts, five stars, something you like, Twitter handle or email address. You're in a draw for the pool of $500 cash. I got another $500 worth of DraftKings Millionaire Maker tickets to give away over on Twitter. So remember to follow me at the PME over there. Newsletter Wednesday and Monday evening. Uh, You can find the free link in the description, plus free money promos in there as well that you're going to want to check out. And the Listener's League link. It's only 5,000 spots, so reserve your spot today, even if you're not filling out your lineup. Smash a like on the way out and give me your favorite fade in the bottom of the comment section. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for letting me share my process with you, and hopefully you come up with a better process that helps you win millions of dollars this week on DraftKings at the U.S. Open. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!